Hey everyone, and welcome to our December live event for National Sewing Circle. We once again have Nikki LaFoyle here answering all of your sewing questions. Thanks for being here, Nikki. Thanks. Hi, everyone. All right, so we're going to get started with some questions right off the bat. And our first one here is from Verani, and she says, how do you machine applique? Um, so machine applique is really fun. It's a great way to um, add color, and you can add any shape you want. Um, onto your base fabric. So um, the easiest way is to use a fusible web. So fusible web is <clears throat> this kind of transparent paper. It's got web on one side and a paper backing on the other. So you can draw whatever shape you want. You can print out some shapes. There's a ton of free appliques online. Here's a dinosaur because my daughter really loves dinosaurs. For some reason right now um, so you can trace this fusible web is great because it's kind of see-through so you can trace your shape onto the fusible web um, onto the paper side of the fusible web um, and you'll be able to tell by feeling that the web side is kind of rough and the paper side is very smooth and keep in mind when you are doing this for applique that um, you want your shape to be mirror imaged because when you put it on your fabric it's going to be flipped so um, whatever shape you want make sure if it's like a letter it is printed out backward um, so trace your shape here's my dinosaur I've traced my shape onto my fusible web onto the paper side um, so you can do this first and then kind of roughly cut it out or you can cut out just like a square out of your fusible web and fuse it to your fabric and then draw your shape. Either way, it doesn't matter, you get the same result. Um, so I would then fuse my web side to the wrong side of my fabric. So here's the right side. You'd fuse it to the wrong side of the fabric and then cut out your shape. So here's my mini dinosaur that I cut out. Here's the right side of the fabric and the fusible web is on the wrong side and I cut out my shape. And then you want to peel the paper backing off of the fusible web. <clears throat> and a lot of times it's really hard to get it started from the edge. So you can take a pin and just kind of, you know, poke at it somewhere in the middle. Um, don't do it at the edge because you'll fray the edge. But um, kind of poke and pull up at the, the paper with your pin and you'll get that fusible web to tear off. And that leaves the wrong side of your fabric um, sort of waxy with the uh, leftover glue from that fusible web. And that allows you to lay your little shape onto whatever fabric you're putting it on and using your iron to adhere that. Uh, follow the instructions on your fusible web, of course. Um, so the fusible web helps to keep the edges from fraying on your applique. Um, it lets you adhere your shape onto your base fabric. And then you'll want to stitch around um, the edges. So using a zigzag stitch, you can use um, your default settings of your zigzag stitch to just follow the raw edges so that the right needle swing swings just over the raw edge. Or you can bump down the stitch length of your zigzag stitch so that the, the threads lay really close to one another. And that's getting more toward your satin stitch. Um, and that will completely finish the edges so that you won't even see the raw edge. Um, some people will tell you that the satin stitch, it'll look more professional, uh, but it also adds more weight to your applique. And if you're doing something small um, with a lot of sharp corners, it may add too much bulk. It may be too difficult to do um, your stitches, uh, your threads close together in that satin stitch. So you can leave your zigzag stitch kind of open um, if you would like. And um, a applique foot can help you um, when you're zigzag stitching around those raw edges of your applique. Um, that just has a more open toe on the, um, the presser foot so you can really see exactly where you're stitching. Um, but you can also do it with your regular presser foot. Just, um, you know, being careful of making sure you, you know where your raw edges are and where you're stitching over. Um, so that's 
basics of, of machine applique. It's really fun to do. And if you want to do layers, um, like if you have an owl applique, you know, you lay the body down and then um, adhere it down. And then you lay your belly layer down and, or your eye layer down or your wing layer down, whatever. You can layer different fabrics on top of each other to create some really cool effects. So there's a lot of fun things you can do with it. Um, and it's pretty easy to do once you get started. Absolutely. And I mean, if you don't have the fusible web, you can use pins, but definitely it's a lot easier to not have to be taking those out or moving around them or anything like that. Yeah. And you can use um, temporary spray adhesive, you know, anything to adhere the that uh, applique down. But I like the fusible web because you can draw the shape right on it. So you have your your cutting lines right there. It just makes mm -hmm. combines the steps makes it really easy. Absolutely. All right. Our next question here is from Wanda, and she wants to know how you sew hook and lip, hook and loop tape or Velcro on a sewing machine without the thread catching and knotting. Yeah. So um, the Velcro, if you're having that problem, it's probably going to be on the hook side, the scratchy side of the Velcro. Um, so you want to make sure that you're using a thread that's not um, uh, not real like fray kind of like a 100% cotton thread is going to be a little bit loftier than a nice sleek all-purpose thread or a rayon thread so the the extra loft of those fibers can get caught in the the hook of that uh, hook and loop tape or velcro um, so that's one tip also um, to beat a dead horse you can use tissue paper to lay on top of uh, that Velcro, um, and that will help keep the thread from getting caught and tangled in those hooks. Um, I have never actually had that happen to me, um, having thread um, catch in the Velcro when I'm stitching it, but that's just kind of some in theory things that I think would help, um, so you can try some of those. The only time I've had Velcro or had problems with the thread is on the underside when I'm trying to use like a lightweight needle and it's the needle isn't actually piercing, making a big enough hole to go through the Velcro. So I had to put on a heavier duty needle to actually like sew through the Velcro. So that could help too. Good tip. Uh, and just to explain our dead horse in case this is the first time that anyone <laughs> right. is Sorry. tuning in uh, to a... National Sewing Circle Live event with Nikki LaFoyle. She uses tissue paper for so many different things, but all useful things that help with sewing. So you'll you'll hear about that at least once a month. So have some tissue paper in your sewing room and you'll find out how to use it. Yes, keep that tissue paper. It's very versatile, I promise. Yes. All right, our next question here is from Charlene, and she would like some tips on how to create more professional looking pieces. Um to get nice, crisp kind of professional looking projects. Um, <clears throat> your iron is your best friend. Iron open your seams. Um, if it's a cotton, blast it with steam that gets nice crisp seams. Um, that helps. <clears throat> um, finishing your seam allowances is something that um, not you're not gonna see from the outside, but if you're giving it as a gift or, or selling some projects, um, it makes the inside of the garment or project look really nice and professionally finished. Um, a twin, a twin needle or a double needle um, makes really professional, nice-looking hems. So that is something that you could check out. Um, those are some, yeah, just some tips to to get started. Professional-looking items. Yeah, absolutely. I think seam finishing is definitely the what makes things look super professional. And uh, since you mentioned it, we're going to skip to a question here from Mary, and she wants to know how you thread and use a double needle. All right, cool. All right, let me turn a little bit because we're going to do some demo here. So your double needle, where did I put mine, is exactly what it sounds like. It's two needles attached to a single shaft. And these come in um, a lot of different widths, so you can get this one is pretty these needles are kind of close together you can get some that are a lot wider um, to just create different looks um, just make sure when you put your double needle on your machine you're not using a single uh, a straight stitch throat plate uh, because double needle obviously won't go through that 
it will break on your throat plate. And when I put this on my machine, my machine defaults to a left needle setting and it would have hit my throat plate and broken. So I had to choose, uh, shift my needle to the center um, to avoid that. But you can, um, on my throat plate, I can do a, a straight stitch with a double needle. I can do a zigzag stitch. Um, so, let me get my buttonhole foot off here. So you can, um, threading a double needle is the hardest part, really. But if you have um, a extra spool pin that comes with your machine, my um, kind of lightweight brother had an extra one, so yours probably will. If you don't, you can, um, if you have a serger, you can just set your serger next to your machine and use one of those spool pins for your second th um, thread spool. You can rig something up. Anything that just lets you set a, a thread spool kind of next to the one that's already on there. So mine attaches here. Let me throw this needle on. So you're threading the needles. It's going to be the same threading path. But when you th you're going to thread the the left needle first with your thread spool that is on here normally. Then you'll set your other thread spool up and thread it exactly the same through the same pass, but do not thread it through this last needle guide, the thread guide that's just above the needle. Don't put your second uh, thread through that. So you would thread those uh, just as you normally would. And this is what it looks like. You can stitch, it just stitches two, um, two lines of stitching right next to each other. And I tried a zigzag stitch with it and that worked out great. And then on the wrong side, if you can see, stitch with a double needle, the bobbin thread makes kind of a, a zigzag stitch on the wrong side. So this is great for using with uh, knit fabrics. You can stitch hems with this and have a nice stretchy uh, line of stitching <clears throat> while getting a, a what looks like a straight line on the front, which is um, a nice imitation ready to wear um, kind of thing. It looks like it came from a factory. You can do those hems with the two lines of stitching. Um, so if there are any follow-up questions on that, please let me know. This is kind of a cursory thing. I know it's kind of hard to see back there, um, but it's just you got your two thread spools. You thread it, you know, the same as you would if it was just one needle, um, and it's it's really easy to use. So it's a it's a great tool for professional-looking items and for sewing with knits. Um, highly recommend it. If, if you were to take your regular thread and put it in the right hand side of the needle rather than the left hand, would that mess anything up? I am not sure. Um, I haven't tried it. That's just how I learned how to do it. So that's just always how I do it. Well, well so I guess if you, if you do do that differently and you have a problem, then switch them and see if that helps. Yes. You know. Yeah. All right. Our next question here is from Michelle, and she wants to know how old is too old thread? Well, um... The age of the thread, I have found, doesn't matter too much. It's more of a question of how it was stored. So I know a lot of people use vintage threads from their grandma and, you know, the, the spools that come on the wooden spools, and they work just fine. Um, you just want to make sure the thread was stored in a dry place uh, out of the sun because um, once it gets um, touched by humidity, um, that kind of will start to degrade the, the threads. Um, so I would say, um, no, no age is, is too old for thread. Just give it a try. If you get a lot of thread breakage, that could be a factor. Um, but yeah, don't be afraid to use old thread. Um, it can be a great resource.
Yeah, absolutely. And you have some old thread that you maybe don't know how it was stored, like if you, you inherited it or something. They make something called Sewer's Aid, and it's like a thread conditioner. And you just run that along your thread, too, and that can sort of bring new life back to your thread if you're not sure if it's really old or not. So. All right, our next question here is from Sonia. And she says, what is the amount of seam allowance that you like to sew with? Um, personally, I sew with a half inch seam allowance, and the main reason for that is it's easier for me to add in my head when I'm drawing my own patterns and making my own projects. Um, it's just easier for me to work with, and I found that it's it gives me plenty of seam allowance for the, the seaming, uh, to make a nice strong seam, um, and plenty of room for seam finishing. Um, and now when I um, when I make a project from a commercial pattern and I use five eighths of an inch, I'm like, wow, this is the seam allowance. It seems huge. So a half inch, it uses less fabric. Um, it's just easier for me to to figure out in my head, and um, I've never had any problems with it. So um, yeah, personally, half inch is my go-to. Perfect. All right, our next question here is from Joyce, and she says, a few months ago, <clears throat> I bought sequin stretch fabric to make something for my nine-year-old granddaughter, but haven't had the courage to do anything with it yet. I really don't want to sit and pick out all the sequins before I seam, so please advise. <laughs> yes, sequin fabric can be kind of intimidating, um, and I know it can be a lot of work, but um, you really just, you don't want to get those sequins um, along your stitching line because you can break a needle um, and just some really uh, bad things there. So you want to, if not all the way out of all of the seam allowance, you just want to get the sequins out of the stitching line. Um, if you leave some sequins in the seam allowance, um, that will uh, remain, you know, against your skin when you're wearing it. So keep that in mind. But if if that's not a bother, you can just um, take the sequins out of uh, along the stitching line to make sure your needle doesn't hit those sequins. So you can take your bottle of glue and just run it along on the wrong side. Run it along the stitching line to um, to uh, attach those threads. So if your sequin fabric has a lot of sequins attached with one thread. Um, run that glue along so that when you cut the thread and take those sequins out off of your stitching line, um, a bunch of other sequins aren't going to fall off with it. Um, if all the sequins are attached separately, I am sorry. It's going to require a lot of unpicking and um, taking those sequins off, but just make sure that they are out of the way of your needle. Um, I don't think there's too much getting around that, but I know Ashley, you've done a lot of um, advising on sewing with problematic fabric like that. Do you have any anything else to add? Yeah, actually, the the sequin fabric that um, that I generally find, like in the costume section of like say Joann's or something, is they're like glued in place. They're not oh. sewn in, which sewn in is sometimes easier because you can just clip that thread. But for the glue in ones, I actually take them off with my iron, so I just get a warm iron and run it right along the top of the sequins and it melts the glue that holds the sequins in place and then they kind of static cling to the back of your iron so then you turn your iron off uh, and then you just take a cloth and wipe them all off and so it doesn't stick to your iron you don't get any of the glue on there but it just it takes them right off so it saves a lot of time than picking so cool. i'm a huge fan of using the iron yeah <laughs> okay. great all right, our next question here is from Sherry, and she wants to know what type of stabilizer to use when embroidering on fleece. Um, so in general, you want to match your stabilizer weight to your fabric weight. So with a fleece, I would use um, either like a medium weight tear away or maybe even a kind of a lighter weight cutaway um, since fleece is going to be a little bit heavy. Um, and then you may want to use a topper with fleece as well since fleece is kind of you know, squishy with a little bit of a pile or a loft. <clears throat> and so your topper is going to be just like a water soluble stabilizer, or they sell varieties that are actually called toppers. You can do um, heat removable toppers. So that just floats over the design area on top of the fabric. So you've got your stabilizer underneath hooped. And the topper will just 
float over everything. And that just helps the, the threads um, kind of raise up a little bit so that they don't sink down into that pile of that squishy fleece. Um, and then when you're done stitching, tear that topper away just as you would stabilizer. And then you can remove the rest with um, either, you know, they make water soluble varieties as well. So you can remove the rest from the design perimeter with water or heat removable. Um, so that can help uh, your stitches stay afloat. Um, but yeah, my general rule, matching your stabilizer weight uh, to your fabric weight. So with fleece, um, kind of a mid-weight, probably stabilizer. Perfect. All right, a uh, quick follow-up question here. Peggy wants to know what type of glue you were just referring to. I have my fray check here. So that dries clear. Um, you'd want to use it on the wrong side anyway, but it dries clear. But you could use um, any kind of fabric glue that you have. Um, I have a bunch of different varieties as well. Um, but yeah, whatever sort of fabric glue would uh, adhere those, um, those threads would work. Perfect. All right, our next question here is from Annette, and she wants to know how to apply elastic to a waist of a skirt that does not have a waistband. This is one of my favorite questions. <laughs> I, I feel like I demo this all the time, but I love it. Um, so you can adhere or stitch elastic to a waistband in a ton of different ways um, with a lot of different um, with a lot of different looks. So these are actually my um, my little demo projects from, I actually, um, I taped a video for sewing National Sewing Circle uh, a couple months ago, so it should be up on the site before too long, but I demo all of these in full, so you can check that out if you want a little more information. But um, adding elastic to a waistband, uh, this is a really fun way. This is fold over elastic. So it comes in a lot of different widths. It's just got this um, sort of indentation along the center, which makes it really easy to simply fold over the raw edge of your waistband. And this is great for um, when you don't have any extra material on your waistband for a casing. Um, say you cut your skirt a little too short and you don't have any room for you know, a casing or hem or anything. Um, so you can just fold this over the raw edge, use your zigzag stitch um, to stitch. Of course, I use black thread, so you can't really see it, but use your zigzag stitch to stitch just right along that edge of that elastic, and that gives you a nice stretchy waistband. Um, so that's one option. That's fun. And fold over elastic comes in all kinds of different colors. I've seen it in glitter varieties and all kinds of fun prints, so that's kind of cool. Um, this is an exposed waistband with my um, kind of wider elastic here, and that is really easily attached as well. You can stitch your stitch your elastic into a circle, um, lay it along the right side of the fabric, quarter mark it, so pin, uh, attach your, your elastic to your waistband um, in quarters, and then you'll want to stretch your elastic to match the the fabric width and um, use your zigzag stitch to stitch right along the edge there and that'll gather the fabric into the waistband. You have a little bit of gathers up there but that's fun. This kind of uh, woven elastic um, you'll find it in all kinds of different colors as well. Um, but then of course you can do your casing which is just your you know your double fold double fold it up here, you leave a little bit open to thread your elastic through, and then you know stitch the elastic ends and then finish that off. So um, there's a lot of different ways to add elastic to, uh, to your waistband. This one is fun, this is called a faux casing. So you want to, for a faux casing, lay your elastic on the wrong side of the fabric, and attach it just as you would exposed, the exposed waistband I just showed you, but on the wrong side, and then fold that elastic under, and you can stitch that, um, you know, you wanna stretch it again so that you don't get uh, gathers in your fabric when you're stitching that close, but you can use a straight stitch to stitch right along, um, 
right along there as well so that it looks like a regular casing from the right side, but is it is actually stitched to the fabric so there will be no twisting or anything um, and it's nice and sturdy. So um, elastic waistbands are super easy. It's my favorite way to do waistbands on skirts. And like I mentioned, um, the full demo will be on the National Sewing Circle site in one of my videos uh, a little bit later on. So I know that's kind of hard to see with just, just showing the finished product, but um, hopefully that gives some ideas for that. Absolutely, and that's so the video that you did it's, it's an upcoming class, and it, she was right; it should be on the the site soon. Um, but that was an intermediate intermediate sewing skill class, correct? Yes. Okay, so if you're wanting to look for that exact uh, video, intermediate sewing skills or something along that line, the title might get changed a little bit, uh, but that should be what to search for if you want to find that class. All right, our next question here is from. Jerry and she says I'm sewing with chiffon and my seams are puckering. How can I fix this? Um, so chiffon is can be kind of tricky to sew with because it is so thin and delicate um, <clears throat> Using a microtex needle may help a microtex needle just has a really fine sharp point um, that can help um, Help you to not get puckers in chiffon or um, you can still use your all-purpose needle, but use a, a lighter, uh, like a smaller size needle. Uh, make sure you're using appropriate thread. So um, a, a nice, thin, lightweight thread. Silk thread is great to use with chiffon because it's nice and it's strong and uh, it's thin. <clears throat> um, you can use, sorry guys, you can use tissue paper. Um, that just helps support the fabric um, since your chiffon is so so like airy and thin it just adds a little bit of support <clears throat> so that the threads don't really overwhelm that fabric so um, those are just a couple of basic things to try first well we did make it nearly halfway through before we got to the <laughs> tissue paper tip so we're making progress here <laughs> all right uh, our next question here just came in. This is from Birdie, and I'm not sure if you're going to be able to uh, actually demo this for us, but you can probably explain it pretty good. And she wants to know how you put a zipper in the liner of a tote. Hers always ends up upside down. Does she need to turn the liner inside out and then put it in, or how does she go about doing that? Um, so putting a zipper in, like, a lined purse, um, <clears throat> I just did something like that and um, if, if I'm understanding the question correctly you want to make sure that the zipper um, the right side of the zipper is facing the the part of the fabric that will be um, that will be uppermost like will be um, higher up on the purse gosh that's hard to explain <laughs> um, I guess I'm picturing that when she makes the the actual liner of the bag, then the zipper, like the zipper pull is actually underneath, like you have to reach inside the bag to close it. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm trying to <laughs> figure out how to explain without uh, really showing. Um, but yeah, the, if you can kind of visualize it, the, the right side of the zipper, um, needs to be against the, so if the zipper is going like right on the, the upper edge of the purse, the the right side of the zipper would be against the outside of the fabric. Hmm. Yeah, I think the easiest way I think to do it is to just always pick fabrics that have a definite right side, and then that way you know the right side of the fabric and the right side of the zipper are going together. And if any time you're sewing the right side of the zipper to the wrong side of the lining fabric, you're going to have some problems. So as long as your right sides together all the time, you should you should be fine. So. Give that a try. <laughs> okay, our next question here, we're gonna get into some pattern alteration questions. Um, but our first one here, uh, someone would like just some general information on where to begin in pattern drafting. Um, so I always start with <clears throat> a sloper. And a sloper is just um, like your basic block pieces. Um, so if you, um, I think Berta Style sells a good sloper. Um, some of the other big pattern companies may sell slopers, but it's just like a, 
um, you know, a scoop neck, set in sleeve pattern, something really simple um, that you you'll want to um, to stitch in a in a mock up and get that get that pattern um, to your measurements and get it fitting right. And then you can take that block pattern and um, use that as your base for all kinds of different alterations. Or um, if you don't want to bother with a sloper. A lot of times I will just go in my um, my pattern library and find the pattern that is the closest in design to what I want to uh, design, what I want to alter it to. Um, and, but you won't, you'll want to do the same thing, make a mock-up, make sure it fits you right um, to have that base before you make any alterations. And um, I always have my trusty French curve ruler that's really good for pattern drafting and pattern alterations. It's got all these different grades of curves along this edge. And this um, styling design ruler can come in different shapes. Sometimes it's uh, more like rectangular, but it still has all those different curves along the outside edge. Um, so you can use that for arms eye curves, uh, hip curves, uh, you know, necklines, anywhere you have a curve. Um, you can just find the curve along the ruler that mostly matches it and a lot of times I'm I'm drawing in my curves at like one inch at a time you know to uh, trace that curve and then move it slightly to make sure that the curve is aligned um, so this is a great tool for pattern alterations and pattern drafting um, those are that's kind of the basics there's so much uh, under the umbrella of pattern drafting um, it's tough to to know where to start but um, I know there's a lot of great videos on National Sewing Circle um, for pattern alterations and pattern drafting but um, starting with your your basic block you know that's always the building block that I start from and always make sure you have a, a copy of your base pattern uh, set aside somewhere so that you're not you know altering that pattern and cutting it up and um, you want to make sure you can get that shape back so you have a you have a backup of that shape. Um, so always uh, trace a copy of your pattern before you start uh, cutting it up. So absolutely, and I don't know if you have it within reach, so I don't want to <laughs> make it make you have to run all over the place. But I know you've you've shown a book that you like to use and you refer to a lot. I know it's something that helped you a lot when you were first learning and uh, going to school for for pattern designing and everything. So you can see you're reaching for it. This guy. Yep. Uh, designing apparel through the flat pattern. It's a college textbook, so I don't know um, if you'll be able to. You should should be able to find it. Um, but this is. Uh, it gives you directions for step by step instructions for altering to all kinds of different styles. So. Um, it gives you instructions for slashing and spreading and pivoting, and um, that's always what I refer to. So it's a great reference. Absolutely, and I just want to point out too that I believe it's also in that same class, your intermediate um, sewing skills class, you have a whole section on uh, pattern alterations and things like that too, and you have lots of little um, tiny scales pattern pieces and you show how to make all those alterations too. So uh, that that is also coming up, and we do have another class actually that I did that's coming up that's uh, completely all about pattern alterations too and does show uh, things like that too. So again, Always on our website, we have tons of videos and classes to help you out with any of your sewing questions as well. All right, our next question just came in here, and this is from Jackie. And she says, I have heard many times that you shouldn't sew over pins, that if you hit one, it will throw off the timing of your machine. How do you know if your timing is off? Um, well, my, my main concern with sewing over pins is if your needle hits a pin, you can break a needle. And you know, the tip of that needle may come flying at you. So that's that's my main concern. Um, or you'll, you know, bend your pins. It's not a huge deal, but then you have to throw them away. Um, but yes, it could also knock off your timing. Um, I think if you're, if you're getting a lot of skipped stitches, um, if those, you know, that needle thread and the bobbin thread isn't quite catching, you're gonna get skipped stitches. Um, so if that's a big problem, your timing may be off. Um, if you if you're having a lot of tension issues that you just cannot fix a lot of thread nests, that may be an issue of timing um, um, yeah I think those are 
going to be your main symptoms yeah. of tension problems. I would say, and then that's if like your timing's off a little, you can throw it off like a lot too. I actually did that. I was borrowing um, my grandma's machine. It's now my machine that I have, but it's a really old machine and I did hit a pin with it and it threw it off to where when the needle came down or how the bobbin case rotated, it actually hit the bobbin case so you couldn't even form a stitch at all. So like nothing was happening. So I mean that was really, really thrown off. I think you can have degrees of thrown off timing. But so if, if that's happening, that's definitely a problem <laughs> that you yeah, should have perfect. fixed. Um, so yeah, any one of those things. All right, our next question here is from Lenine, and she says, can I shorten the rise in pants by adjusting the crotch area? She doesn't want to have to remove the waistband. Yes, you can. Um, <clears throat> if you take in, so here's my jeans, um, this U shape is your crotch seam. So you can take up the rise if you, you know, unpick this inseam a little bit down here, and you can, um, just kind of take that in from the inseam, so you're taking away from the crotch seam as well, so that will raise the rise. Uh, but you're also taking out of the thigh area when you do that alteration. So <clears throat> I would say you can um, take up the rise here, but don't do it by too much because it is also going to throw off some other fitting areas. So if you want to, um, if you don't wanna take off the waistband, you can also try um, just pinching out a little bit of fabric right under the waistband and stitch your seam um, just right under that waistband. So you will have, you may be able to see it on the right side, but that seam will be right under the waistband so you can kind of camouflage it. And you can do a combination of those alterations as well. You can do a little bit at the crack seam and a little bit up here. Um, but I just, I would be afraid of doing too much right there because it is going to take some out of the thigh area when you do that. Gotcha. All right. Since we're talking about pants, uh, Yvonne wants to know what is the best way to hem trousers for fast growing young people? Uh, she doesn't want to cut off any of the fabric in case she has to use that later on. That is a good idea. Save that hem fabric for letting that out for, for kids. Um, I would do just like a one inch double folded hem. So take one inch, fold it up and then fold it up again. And then you can stitch right along that uh, first fold. And that'll give you a lot of room to grow. So you can um, unpick that and let it out however much you need. And you can go, you know, that'll give you like an inch and a half of extra room. So you can go all the way down to a tiny little um, quarter inch double folded hem when they get that tall uh, before you have to start over. But um, you can do a double folded hem even, you know, even uh, larger than that. You can double fold one and a quarter inch, one and a half inch. Um, of course, it's going to get, you know, your hem is going to get bigger and bigger at the bottom. But um, you can, for kids, you know, kids don't usually care all that much. Um, so just make sure you have, give yourself a lot of room at the bottom in that double folded hem. And um, you'll have a lot of room to grow and let that out. Absolutely. All right, we have a couple questions here, um, both from Lynette and Denise, and they have questions about downloading and printing out patterns. They say they always have problems either knowing where exactly to tape the patterns together or just how to download designs from various sites on the internet uh, in general. So any tips you have for both of those things? So um, for the, the patterns that you print out at home, that can be kind of tricky because uh, some patterns, uh, you know, a blogger will just put up a pattern and um, you won't have like cross marks or any sort of landmarks to tape those together. So that can be kind of tricky. Um, but um, a lot of the patterns are great because they are, they, the pieces will be numbered. Um, a lot of times you will have this the sheet layout guide. So all the pieces will be numbered so you can have this kind of map to refer back to. Um, <clears throat> so the pieces, if they're numbered, that's awesome. And this pattern doesn't really have any cross marks or anything to align with. You just have to kind of align the pattern lines. So um, you've got your, this looks like a quarter inch here at the, the upper edge. Here's the, the edge of the pattern. 
So I would um, trim that off, uh, trim that little bit off so that you can align that the edge of that pattern line onto the next piece. So you can make sure you're lining those up right where one line ends. You want it to begin on the next page and tape those together and then cut the pattern pieces out. Um, some patterns, this, is, this one is an old Sew News one. This is great because it's got that layout guide as well. And all the pieces are numbered uh, 1A, 1B, 1C for the first row, and then 2A, 2B, 2C down there. Um, and those are great. Those have these dotted lines that tell you where one page should begin and the other should end. And then, you know, you've got a little bit extra of the line um, outside of that to know where you overlap for the next page. So overlapping lines are great. Sometimes patterns will have um, cross marks in the corner. So you have to align those cross marks and tape all the pages together and then cut your pattern pieces out. Um, but if you have straight lines in your patterns, those are great for lining the edges up. Um, so it's just a matter of making sure you align um, at the edge. So there's the, the edge of the pattern piece. I like to trim that off so that I can see exactly where um, that piece is overlapping to the next. So just trimming that off of one, piece, one edge and aligning it um, on the next piece and using a lot of tape. And I know it's really, it can be kind of frustrating with print at home patterns because if something gets off, you know, just a tiny little bit, it adds up. But um, if you can find uh, good print at home patterns, um, I know Sonu's patterns are really great these days. They have a lot of uh, cross marks and reference points for you to, to align those and tape those together. Um, so if, if you can find an, an online reference for patterns that has uh, good patterns like that, then uh, it'll be a lot easier to be accurate. And I know a lot of um, sites or wherever you're downloading them from will have uh, printing instructions, but in general, do you have to uh, scale to print or fit print to page, or what do you have to do setting-wise like that? Um, that depends. So when you open up the pattern, if all you see is the pattern in, in its entirety, you will have to tile those pages. So there should be an option um, if you're using Adobe to tile all pages and that will break them up into eight and a half by 11 sheets. Um, but if you open up the pattern and on one page you only see like one line going across, that means that um, the, pat the pattern is already tiled. So you can just go ahead and print that. Perfect. All right, our next question here just came in. This is from Marsha and she would like to know how to determine how to cut a half circle or full circle skirt without having to hang the skirt to get the correct hem. Um, so when you're drawing a circle skirt, um, this is like a fun geometry class problem. Um, you can get a string. So however um, long you want the skirt, cut a string to that length. Um, tie one end around a pencil and tape the other end to your paper and draw yourself a circle, um, or maybe pinning the end of the string to the to the paper would give a more accurate. That way you can like pivot around and it doesn't yeah, work. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's that's um, it, a simple basic way. That's um, the method that I usually use. Or you can um, just use your ruler and measure every you know, inch or so along the line and then connect the dots. Um, that's a pretty foolproof way to go about it as well. So, and that should give you um, the same, you know, measurement all the way around the skirt. Absolutely. And just because I know we have this on our site, we have a blog post and an article about um, how to draft your own circle skirt pattern too. So it has um, some more visuals in there and some, um, picture tutorials that go along with that too. So again, that's in our blog section or article section on the site. All right, our next question here um, is from Deborah, and she would like to know how to miter a corner. 
She says she has such difficulty with this, and I think a lot of us do. So, if yes. you can give us any tips. Ta da! I have samples. Um, this is also going to be in my intermediate sewing video. So, a lot of good information in that video if you want to check that out when it gets up on the site. Um, so, mitering corners is really easy. Um, it is the same if you're using single fold or double fold binding. Um, the technique is the same. So you align your binding with your um, whatever it is that you're binding. This is a pot holder. Um, so align the raw edges and start stitching. And when you get to one edge of the pot holder, stop stitching. Whatever your seam allowance is, mine is a half inch, um, stop a half inch your seam allowance away from the edge. Remove it from the needle, cut the threads, take your binding, fold it up so that you get a 45 degree fold here and the edge of the binding is in line with this edge of the project. So it's all in a straight line there. Fold that back down so that you get a fold at the top and that fold is in line with this edge and the raw edge of the binding is in line with the raw edge of the project. And then start stitching again right at the very edge, right at the fold here, right at the edge, using your half inch seam allowance, and keep stitching. Do that for all four corners. And then when you reveal your corner, it forms automatically this beautiful, perfect miter at the corner. And then on the wrong side, you just have to kind of fold that in place with your fingers. You can fold yourself a miter and get, get your corner miter and then put a pin in it to hold that in place. But on the wrong side, you do have to kind of work it with your fingers and it's kind of hard for me to see what I'm doing here, but then you get your, you get your miter on the wrong side. Pin it stitch in the ditch to hold it, and it's the same thing with your single fold. So there's the corner when it's stitched. So we, uh, we did our folding our, of our binding up and then down, stitching here, and then we fold it, you get your, your lovely corner on the wrong side, fold that down into a miter, and then stitch in the ditch or hand stitch to catch the fold. Um, so it's a really easy technique. Um, uh, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> it really is pretty easy once you get the, um, know which way you need to fold first to create the miter, then it's pretty easy. So once you get the folding down, the sewing is pretty easy. Exactly. All right, our next question here is from Lynn, and she wants to know what is the best way to hem yoga pants, either sewing machine or by hand? I would do that by machine. Whenever you can do something by machine rather than hand, that's always the avenue I'm going to take. It's quicker and easier. Um, and in that case, it would give you the, the same effect. Um, it's going to be a nice strong hem. You can use your double needle and get that, um, that nice double needle look on your hem. And a lot of times for yoga pants at the bottom, um, it doesn't need to stretch over anything if you've got a, you know, a wide enough hem at the bottom. So you can just use... You can use your single needle straight stitch um, to stitch that hem because it's not going to need any stretch to it. Um, so double fold that hem. Or even if you're, you know, yoga pants are usually knits, so you don't really even need to double fold that uh, since the edges won't ravel. Um, so just fold it up and press it and give it a stitch and um, you're done. It's easy to do on a, on a machine for, for a hem like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of always picking the machine over hand sewing as well. <laughs> All right, our next question here is from Sable, and she wants to know how to make a weighted quilt or blanket. Um, yes, weighted blankets are really great. Um, kids love them, especially if, um, you know, um, a child has, you know, some sensory, um, sensory issues that can help them feel calm. Um, so uh, weighted quilt, let me see. There's a really good tutorial on, on, da, da, da. I have so many tabs open, uh, mamasmiles.com. 
has a good tutorial with a lot of great tips and advice from a lot of her readers. Um, so to get the weight in your weighted quilt, you're using, or your weighted blanket, you're using um, uh, Polly Pellet's weighted stuffing beads is what she recommends. And um, you can get those online, but they're so heavy, so shipping can sometimes be costly. So if you can find them in person, that's maybe the best way to go. Um, but you want to take your blanket and you've got, you know, your front and your back, right sides together. So three sides. So these sides are already sewn. Leave the top open. And then you'll want to sew parallel lines running along lengthwise. And um, you only need the weight, uh, you know, where it's going to lay on your body. So you can you, you can give yourself kind of a wide border because um, you only need the, the weight kind of in the middle of the blanket. Um, and uh, a funnel can sometimes, or a uh, paper towel, cardboard tube can be helpful in getting the pellets down into the blanket. Um, but measure out, you know, an equal amount of pellets for each, um, for each line. And um, her tutorial has a, a good uh, guideline for how many pellets you should put in. Um, but then you're sewing, you'll put some, a little bit of pellets along each, uh, in each line, and then sew across to, um, to keep those pellets right there where you want them. So like a four inch square is kind of a good place to start. Add more pellets to each line, stitch across. So you're kind of quilting those pellets in, and then you can um, finish the upper edge, turn those edges under and finish that. Um, so on that mamasmiles.com, she says that you don't want the weight of the blanket to be any more than 10% um, of the person's body weight who's using it. So if it's kids, that's um, an especially important thing to take into account. Um, so it should weigh about 10% of their body weight plus one to two pounds. Um, so you wanna make sure it's not too heavy on a child. Um, but that's kind of a basic, my basic pen drawing, but mamasmiles.com has a good tutorial, um, even more instructions than that. So check that out for more pictures and stuff. Perfect. I feel like those would be good. I would want one of those, just nice and cozy and cuddly. It does. It sounds very cozy. It does. All right. Our next question here, speaking about cozy, cuddly quilts, um, Kim would like to know, she says she's going to be making t-shirt quilts and wants to know the best way to back the shirts. Um, so to, um, if this is a, asking about like stabilizing the blocks of the t-shirts, yeah. um, so you want to choose a stabilizer, either a woven or a non-woven that is not a knit. So um, I know they make Trico stabilizers or interfacings, um, but you don't want you don't want to choose that because you want something that is going to keep the t-shirt from stretching out. So a lightweight uh, woven or non-woven uh, stabilizer will help will keep those knit edges from um, getting wonky when you're stitching them. So making sure you uh, match the weight of the, the stabilizer to the weight of the t-shirt. Um, but yeah, something non-woven, um, non-woven or woven, just not knit. All right, absolutely. And if you are um, confused and when you go to the store and you don't really know what, what you're getting, you can actually buy the um, t-shirt quilts have become very popular nowadays and you can actually buy uh, like t-shirt fuse and it's, it's uh, marketed and packaged and it even says, you know, for making t-shirt quilts and it's it's essentially just, a, just the, the stabilizer but meant specifically for backing the t-shirts for quilts. So um, sometimes that can be a little bit more expensive because it is sort of pre-packaged little pieces, um, but that is an option too. Um, you can look for that. All right, our next question here is from Lucy and she wants to know how to make a camisole uh, for wearing with v-neck sweaters. Um, so making a camisole, I have a ton of these um, for layering purposes. And I actually, I didn't even look up any tutorials for making a camisole because it seems like it's pretty, it, the shape is pretty, um, pretty simple. So if you have one of these, you can take it and kind of trace the shape. The back is just going to be, you've got your side seams at the side and then 
the back line is pretty straight across. And then on the front, you've just got a little bit of a curve for um, the underarm and then the curve for the scoop in the front. And this elastic to, that finishes all of the edges is just fold over elastic. So you fold that over the edges and stitch it. And if you want to get fancy um, and make it adjustable in the back, they sell these. It's just a ring and then one of those little adjustable doohickeys. You can get those at the craft store. Um, or you can just make, you don't have to make it adjustable. You can just use elastic, um, a line of elastic here for the front, and then a line for the back, and then do some elastic for the straps. And it seems like... Absolutely. And you could yeah. even use your actual camisole you have as your pattern piece, right? You could lay that down and trace it and... Around the shape. Yep, mm -hmm. exactly. Just make sure you're, if you're doing that, that you add seam allowances to the side seam and the bottom. So you can buy one and then make however many you want. Exactly. All right, so this next one might require you to do a little bit of demoing, but Jerry would like to know how to make a buttonhole. Ah, yes. So um, there are a lot of different ways to make a buttonhole. Uh, the easiest way is to use your buttonhole foot. So most machines will come with one of these. My tiny little brother came with one, so yours will probably come with one as well. And that um, makes it really easy to do buttonholes because you can take your button and pop it in here. This slides so you can do a button up to like one and a half quarter inch diameter or something like that. So slide your button in the end of that and push that down so that it, it's kind of measuring the diameter of your button for you. And that goes on your machine so that the button is in the back. And you pull down this little, here, I'll push this on here. Pop your foot on, and then you've got on the side here, a little lever that pulls down. That's um, for buttonhole purposes. You wanna make sure that little lever goes behind the front. Make sure that little lever that you pull down goes behind this front notch because what's gonna happen is that lever is gonna go here and it's gonna, you're gonna stitch your buttonhole thing and then it's gonna hit this back little knob and then that's gonna tell it to stitch the other side of the buttonhole. So that's however long your button is, that's um, as long as your buttonhole is going to be. So it measures it for you, stitches it for you. I have seven different buttonhole settings pre-made on my little thing. So I choose one of those, mash down on the foot pedal, and it just stitches back. It hits the back knob, stitches back the other way, finishes it off. And um, if you are stitching, especially if you're stitching on a lighter weight fabric, even if you're doing on a nice stable cotton, you'll probably want to stabilize the wrong side of your buttonhole just because it um, that's a lot of thread, you know, that's going in and out of your fabric, and it's a stress point on a garment. You're pushing your button in and out of that buttonhole a lot. So I like to do just some lightweight, fusible stabilizer or interfacing um, on the wrong side of that buttonhole. And then, so here's a buttonhole that I have stitched out. Uh, one last buttonhole tip. I did this once, and that was one too many times. When you're cutting through your buttonhole, um, I, you know, you can cut through the bar tack kind of easily if you don't give yourself any safety measures. So, um, I learned this tip, put a pin right along your bar tack on the top and the bottom, and that will prevent you from accidentally cutting through that bar tack when you're opening up your buttonhole. And I like to use, um, my seam ripper actually to open up my buttonhole instead of using snips. You can just insert your seam ripper into the buttonhole and push it up. It stops right at the pin. I'll go the other way. And it opens up that buttonhole really nicely. So perfect. All right, now just because I, I saw that you have the pins in there, and we're gonna pretend that somebody has a really old machine or maybe a machine that just didn't come with that buttonhole foot or maybe they lost it. You can still mark your buttonhole right with your pins and stitch it that way. 
Exactly, yes, you can measure your button. So if you have a half inch diameter button, you want your buttonhole to be a tiny bit longer than that. Um, so if you have a half inch button, you might want to do add you know a quarter inch um, to make your buttonhole so that the button will go through easily. Um, and you can just use your zigzag stitch to stitch each side of, um, of the buttonhole and lower the feed dogs to stitch the bar tack on each end of, uh, of the sides of the buttonhole. Um, and so when you do your zigzag stitch for each side of the buttonhole, you want your zigzag stitch to be the stitch length to be pretty close together. So it's almost like a satin stitch on each side of the buttonhole. Um, and that's about this, the sides of the buttonhole are about an eighth inch apart. If you have a really thick button, you might want to do a little bit, a little bit uh, further apart than that. Um, but you can just stitch, you know, four separate lines to make that that rectangular buttonhole. Um, zigzag stitch on either side. Lower the feed dogs with your zigzag stitch to do the bar tack on the top and the bottom. So it takes a little bit more effort, but you can absolutely still do it. Absolutely, and it's always good um, to just do that at least one time, and then you really appreciate that automatic. <laughs> button pull feature that you have on your machine. So, uh, and they, they do look a little bit different on depending on your machine. I also have a brother that looks just like that, but then I have a Viking that has one that has like this, it looks like a little wheel on there, like a little weird walking thing. So um, definitely consult your manual if your uh, foot looks a little bit different than that one. Definitely. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much for being here tonight to answer all of our questions. And I want to thank everyone who submitted questions and live and beforehand. We definitely appreciate you and hope you join us again next month. And Nikki will be back answering more of your questions again. Uh, so I hope everyone has a good night. Bye.